Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk Commerce Extensibility Overview. My name is Evan and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation and by participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being a part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the event, and we will have some time at the end to speak to some questions verbally. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Sam Jarlon, Principal Program Manager, and Muganthan Mani, Senior Program Manager. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Evan. So as Evan mentioned, we'll be covering the Commerce Extensibility Overview today. So um, Muganthan and I are both Program Managers on Dynamics 365 Commerce, focusing on different parts of extensibility. So we'll be swapping back and forth uh, throughout uh, some different topics here. So I'll start off with a little agenda. First, I will be giving you a brief architectural overview, then an extensibility overview to show you the extensible parts based off of the architecture diagram I'll be showing. And then Muganthan will be covering the HQ and Headless Commerce extensibility section. And finally, I will cover the e-commerce extensibility section at the end. So first, I want to give a little bit of an architectural overview. Um, at the end, I have a link to past tech talks we've given, and we have an in-depth talk that we've already given on commerce architecture. So if you've seen that, you've probably seen this diagram before. If not, I'd highly recommend watching that. It gives great insight and a lot more detail than I'm going to cover here. But I'm just going to give a rough overview um, so that as I'm as we're using certain terms, you'll know what we're talking about as we go along. So um, at the very top, um, I'll bring your attention over to this top section here. Uh, the middle three columns represent the different channels that commerce supports, or at least three of the channels. So over here would be the call center channel and back office user. In the middle is your retail store channel, your brick and mortar stores. And then this last, uh, this uh, third column over here is the e-commerce website channel. Uh, at the far right, we have some e-commerce um, authoring uh, abilities as well. We're not gonna be going into too much detail there because we don't offer any extensibility points here. So back over to the first column, the back office, this, as you can see, has an arrow pointing down to the back office. So if you are familiar with Dynamics 365 Commerce Headquarters, or HQ is a term we'll generally use, uh, you'll be familiar with this section. Um, you can see some arrows down here showing that these uh, apps run on top of the common data service, as well as uh, support the Azure Data Lake Storage, and Power BI is running off of that. So underneath Commerce HQ, you'll see some of the other Dynamics 365 apps that we work with, supply chain, finance, and HR. And we won't be covering any of that in this talk. In the middle column is, as I mentioned, the retail channel. And in here, you'll see things like the cloud point of sale, the modern point of sale, uh, the app version, iOS, Android, as well as hardware stations. And this layer talks directly with our what we call our headless commerce. Um, which enables our omni-channel support. So within, within this box down here, you'll see the commerce scale unit. And below that, you'll see a few other things um, like some services we support, like the commerce AI, the cloud powered search, uh, fraud protection and insights. We won't be going into any details there. We don't have extension points uh, directly in those that we offer through commerce. Um, and then finally, over on this right-hand column, the e-commerce, this represents a customer hitting your e-commerce website, talking to this web storefront. And then just to complete the diagram, over on the right, you'll see some site designers or content authors, and they hit a tool that we use called Site Builder. I'll be showing that a little later 
uh, when I'm giving an overview of some of the e-commerce stuff. Uh, we also have a digital asset manager that uh, you can upload your product or marketing images to, as well as a ratings and review service. Again, we won't be going into much detail on those since they're not extensible. But the main extensible parts are uh, these four that you see listed here. So HQ, which is Commerce Headquarters, uh, Headless Commerce, which contains two parts, the Commerce Runtime, the CRT, and RS, which uh, stands for Retail Server. Uh, next is the Point of Sale. And finally, we have e-commerce. So here are those four um, categories uh, in purple on that same architecture diagram. And you'll see the HQ extensions over here the headless commerce extensions right in the middle here, the point of sale extensions up here, and the e-commerce extensions. Mubenthan will be covering these three over here, and I'll be covering this one over here. So let's move over to that. And with that, Mubenthan, uh, I'll have you take it away. Thank you, Sam. Let me start presenting my screen. Yeah, I hope everyone can see my screen. So before jumping into the headless commerce extension overview, I just want to go give a quick tech stack information on the headless commerce extension and the point of sale. So the headless commerce engine has like two parts, the commerce runtime, which we call it as retail server. Sorry, the commerce runtime, which we call it as the CRT, which contain all the business logic. Also, it does the over data, the web endpoint, which we call it as like retail server. All of those components is written in C sharp. So for any customization on the headless commerce, you need to like know C sharp to do the customization. And all our database is based on SQL. So if you're creating new table or procedure views, you need to know like SQL scripts. And the last on the client side, the point of sale customization, it's all based on HTML, CSS, TypeScript, and then we use knockout but you can also use other ui libraries okay so but all the business logic or the client side is like return and typescript and the views are like html and css based okay. with that we'll i'll give a little overview of the what is headless commerce extensibility and what you can customize in it and what what you will not be able to customize also, I will go over the architecture of the headless commerce engine and then we'll talk a little bit about like once you're done with the customization, how you can package and deploy it. And then I will show a quick demo of all of these different components. Yeah. Okay. So first let's start with the CRT or the commerce headless commerce extension architecture. Okay. So if you've seen the overall architecture diagram, the headless commerce engine is kind of the core engine for the commerce we call it as the core engine because it contains all the required business logic okay so either the client can be either e-commerce or the point of sale or even any other external application can consume this business logic through the web api exposed and then get all the commerce functionality okay that's why like having like a unified commerce engine will also like give you the omni-channel experience if for example if you can buy a by order online and then pick up and store it. Right? So all those omni-channel experiences like provided by this common scale unit because the business logic is kind of like hosted separately so that any different client can consume it. So all our point of sale, even the e-commerce and then the pricing also use the same CRT pricing engine is kind of like shared between the headless commerce and as well as in the HQ. The call center in the HQ back office doesn't call directly to the CSU, the commerce scale unit. It's kind of like you, but uses the same DLL in both the places. OK, so let's do a little bit deep dive on overall the extension flow, at least for this three components, the point of sale, CRT. OK, and then I'll give like a very brief overview on the HQ extension. Yeah. OK, so if you see this overall overview of the extensibility slide, so as I think Sam talked about before, you can customize the e-commerce. You can also customize the finance and operation. I think Sam will talk in detail about the e-commerce development. So I will give a brief overview of the back office. 
So the retail or the commerce solution has three parts, right? The, the client side of it, the back office, and then the headless commerce engine. So the back office contains all the master data and few other business logic, right? So the, even the back office is for the commerce is fully customizable. You can create custom views, custom classes, forms, etc. So you can customize the back office. Okay, suppose you are creating new master data or whatever, or like business logic for your posting and integrating with other modules in the FNO, like the finance or the supply chain. So you can fully customize the commerce classes or also extend it to add new functionality. Okay, so they have like a rich uh, FNO has like the rich extension model. So we can do like class extension, forms extension, and database extension okay, to support all your business need. So I will not go inside too much detail on this one, but to just to give you an overview, this is like the back office for the commerce is also fully customizable. Okay. So then the other part is the headless commerce and the point of sale. So the headless commerce, as I said, does like contains the commerce runtime.net libraries, okay, which you can extend it for custom scenarios okay so the things you can create is like you can create your own api or you can also modify our business logic and it's all like done in c sharp okay and the commerce engine also talks to the database say for example all the master data like product price it's all stored in the sql database right so you can also extend the channel database for your customization scenario which is all in sql same with the client you can also extend the point of sale for to support your UI extension and then some client business logic, client workflows, or like the client validation. You can extend the point of sale application. Okay. So from the overall flow, is like you take the SDK. Okay. There is like two ways you can get the SDK. One, as you said, like here you can use the VHP, which you can download it from the LCS, like the life service, the life cycle service, or you can also provision a developer VM using the life cycle service portal okay or now recently we started publishing the sdk in github so you can also go ahead and download the sdk from the github and then start customizing it okay so from the overall flow like you take the sdk you do your development and compilation and then finally deploy it so all this kind of this yellow boxes are kind of like these are the different components you can customize and then it can be de deployed to different topology like the the cloud hosted or the self hosted i think in the architecture would have covered like what are the different topologies so you can host it either cloud or self or like for the mpos and the offline also you can include the same extension okay. so next i will talk about little bit on the headless commerce architecture okay as i said like the headless commerce contain two main parts one is the commerce runtime which we short from everywhere you will see it's been called as CRT, okay, which contains the core business logic. And I mean core business logic, like any commerce business logic, say for example, when you add item to cart in the e-commerce or in the point of sale, you need to get the product price or you need to get the tax for that item or you need to get the discounts or you need to like see if the product is linked to a serial number or it. So all those core business logic is exposed as like service in by the commerce runtime using the retail server. So all this different business logic is included in the commerce runtime. Okay. And so how this categorized is kind of like categorized into like a, a three layers. Okay. One is the services layer. Okay which say for example all different business logic in the commerce runtime is grouped by services okay so what i mean by services is like say for example all the customer related functionality is grouped into the customer service say like for example creating a customer updating a customer getting the customer orders details or getting the customer recent transactions whatever all those customer related functionality is grouped under the customer service Similarly, for example, all the order related functionality like creating order, updating order, editing order, it's all kind of grouped under the order service. Okay. So and within that service, there will be like for each different scenarios, like create a customer. For all of those servers, there will be multiple request and response. Everything in CRT is kind of like a request and response. So even when you customize, you will customize a particular request. Okay. And the, after the service layer, the second layer is kind of like the workflow layer 
So what the workflow layer does is, like, say for example, when you add an item from the client, you say like, hey, add this item to cart, right? When the client sends that request, internally the CRT does like a lot of other additional things because before adding the item to the cart and sending back to the response, it need to do a lot of things, right? First, get the product details, okay? then get the product price, and then get the product tags, and then get the product discounts. All those different steps, we call it as like workflows. So that is the next is the workflow layer, which is handled by the different services. Okay? And then the third is the database layer. So where which we connect to the different data source. In our case, it's like SQL is the data source. So from the SQL data service, we connect to the channel database to get the master data. Or once the transaction is completed, we'll update back the, the channel database with the transaction details. Okay. And then other important component the headless commerce container is the web API or the OData endpoint. I think this is called as the retail server. So basically all this service is nothing but like the C-sharp class libraries, right? So this needs to be hosted somewhere so that like the point of sale application or the e-commerce can consume it or any third party client or for example, like you are building a power app to show a catalog or something, right? So you need to call the commerce runtime. So this need to be hosted somewhere so that anybody can consume it, right? So that's the job of this retail server, which host all this commerce runtime business logic and expose it as an endpoint with some authentication and authorization. Okay, so that any external client, any client can consume it. Okay. Okay. So from the so that's what the key components in the headless commerce. Two main is like the CRT and then the retail server. CRT contains all the business logic and then the retail server hosts the business logic for any clients to consume. Okay. And then from the extensibility point, all of this services inside CRT is extensible. Say for example, you want to customize the tax flow, right? So we have for tax and the tax service, there will be a request like get tax code, calculate tax service request. So assume like you want to modify that tax logic by integrating with third party service. Then what you can do is like you can override the calculate tax service request and then add your custom logic either by calling a third party service or you can write your own logic to calculate the tax. Okay. Or suppose say for example, you're doing a shipping integration and then you want to call like some shipping provider like FedEx or UPS to get the charges and other credit shipping label or whatever. Then you can override the shipping service and then do additional customization on top of it. Similarly, on the database layer, we have an extension schema where extension can go ahead and say like, hey, I want to create custom table procedures to use. Then you can do all those extension, database extension in this new extension schema we have. Similarly, on the retail server, suppose for example, you created completely new functionality on, for your scenario and then you want to expose it. Then you can also create your new web API and expose this business logic. Okay. Suppose if you are customizing our existing service, then you don't need to like do a new OData endpoint. This is needed only if you are going to create like a new endpoint. Okay? Say for example, you added like a new table management functionality and then you want to expose it. That's where you're going to customize the retail server. Yeah. And then the last component, which kind of like outside of the headless commerce is the proxy. Basically, there is like two types of proxy, TypeScript and then the C-sharp. The proxy is nothing but like a to call any OData endpoint, you need to know the metadata, the API structure, what is the input output parameters and everything, right? So this proxy gives you that manager class so that you can easily call the web API from your application or from even inside the point of sale or the e-commerce, we use this proxy classes to consume, call the retail server API. So the proxy gives more like a simple manager class, for example, there will be like relevant things for customer service. There will be like a customer controller class. So you will just initialize that class and then those call those manager in the back end. Automatically, we resolve that manager class to the right endpoint in the web server, our retail server, and then we'll call that request and get you the response. So this proxy kind of simplifies how you call the REST API. So this is also available as like a separate library, both like TypeScript as well as in C sharp. Because for a client application like e-commerce or something, you can use the TypeScript. Or if it's like a application going to run in Windows or somewhere in the server, you can use the C-sharp library. It depends on your scenario. Yeah. And 
also as i said like i think as sam previously talked about like e-commerce or the bing for commerce search even uh, we did like integration from our search service to we use like bing for commerce search right so from our search service we integrated to a lot of different other services yeah okay that's a brief overview on the headless commerce okay to summarize it contains two main components one is the o data endpoints which exposes all the business logic two is the commerce runtime which contains all the business logic and both of these are like customizable to suit your business need yeah? okay so then i'll little bit talk about like how you can customize the crt and retail server and then late and how it's going to get deployed to different topology and then i will quickly at the end i will quickly show a demo of this yeah? okay so the commerce runtime kind of contains the business logic as right? that business logic supports three different patterns to customize one before every service you can do a pre trigger or a post trigger what exactly the pre trigger is say for example before creating a customer you want to say like do some additional validation or like call some external service to do some additional check then you can do all those in the pre trigger and then what our business logic going to proceed further you can do it or say for example after customer is created you want to call your crm integration system and send some additional information to that system so like hey, this is a new customer creator or something like that then you can do all those in the post trigger okay and the other pattern we support is kind of overriding the handler so of course you say like hey i don't want to completely use your tax service i have a third party integration so i just want to use that service i don't want out of the box business logic to execute in those cases you should completely override the request and then add additional response or you can also override call the standard business logic first and then you can implement additional logic on top of it which you can either do it in the post trigger or you can also override first call hours and then add additional business logic okay so the three main patterns supported in crt is like pre post and then overriding the request handler okay and also you can other thing is like for custom functionality which you don't want to modify but i want to create new functionality then you can also create your own crt request response and then expose that as a web api so that your client can consume it okay the way how we structure this extension is right because we have different components the cloud hosted scale unit which is hosted by microsoft in the microsoft cloud okay azure and then the other way it's on the other thing some customers say like hey i don't want to host it in cloud i due to network or some other issues i want to host it within my store itself right then you can also host the same scale unit the headless commerce or the cloud scale unit within your network also in the store network okay also the same business logic sometimes say i don't have the hosted network my device needs to work as like standalone so then you can also embed the crt as part of your mod modern point of sale installer also Okay, so that it like works in the complete offline. Okay. So the same, the advantage is here is like the same extension you create can the one commerce runtime extension you created can be hosted across different environments or like the different topology. It can be either hosted in cloud or it can be hosted like self-hosted in your local or even it can be like used in the offline scenario. Same with the channel database. That's why we kind of like recently refactored the architecture of the CA. headless commerce extension pattern so that one common extension can be hosted across different and hosting environments here yeah. even you can come up with your new way of hosting and host the crt business logic <clears throat> and other good thing is like it kind of like composable so for example in cloud hosted you want to do a particular business logic or in offline where i i integrated with a third party tax service for online but if if there is no connectivity to my web service tax uh, tax web server then i want to do some offline logic still you can make it more composable hey, make this works only for this scenario for online use a different scenario so you can completely compose it like as per the hosting environment yeah so we have different config files to support those scenarios yeah? and the last thing is like all the out uh, out of the box service as i said like fully extensible you can do a pre trigger post trigger and also you can create override handler as well as you can create a new handler yeah and that's a kind of like the overall big picture of the commerce scale unit extension 
like how you can create an extension and then host across different environment. OK, so I'll show a quick demo of how you can create from where you can get the SDK and then how you can create a simple customization. Okay? I will not go deep inside the course since it's a overview uh, session, but I will just give a quick overview. Yeah. OK, so as I said previously, there is like two ways to get the SDK. One the is starting 10 or 17 or 10 or 16. We started publishing our SDK in the GitHub for the headless commerce engine. So if you go to this particular doc session, so you can see the commerce scale unit repo okay, here published in the GitHub. I can say for example 927 maps to 1017 lock for the 1016. You can click this release here. So it will take you to the GitHub branch where you can see the source code or like the samples and the reference package is all published. So you can download this and start your customization. This is one way to get okay. the other ways where you can also get the SDK from the LCS developer VM. So in the same so here I can, for example, I can go to LCS and then provision a new developer VM. And then once you log into this VM, there will be a, like a C drive folder. Say for example, this is the VM I already provisioned. I logged in. So here, if you go to the service volume K drive and the retail SDK, that all the retail SDK components are available. So you can also do this way. Either download it from the GitHub or you can get it from the by developer VM which you provision in the which will provision using LCS. OK, so I'll show a simple customization. OK, so for example, I created like a simple CRT customization, like a business logic customization. I think I talked about the trigger, right? So what you will need to do is like you just need to extend from this interface. OK, and then say like for which request you want to add trigger like before creating customer. In that case, you will say like create customer request. You can say that this is the request I'm going to add trigger and then you can do all your custom business logic. And then once you are done with all the customization, similarly there are like a lot of samples for how to create different scenarios here. OK, so for if you're creating like a new request response, you're writing some business logic, you can later check all these classes. OK, suppose I created a new extension. So I'm done with my CRT. Now I want to expose this as like a new endpoint. In that case, what you can do is like to expose it as a new endpoint, you will extend from this particular class and then say like what is the method name I need to expose. So this will be the method name that will be exposed. OK, you just need to follow this, use these two attributes. OK, and then just that create your custom method which you want to expose and inside that method generally in the retail server, you should not write any business logic. OK, you should just call the request and CRT request and response. Okay, so it will it will call the business logic CRT and finally it will return the response. So now all these methods will be exposed as the web API okay, inside that web API. Consider this web API is just like a wrapper which exposes CRT. So don't write any business logic here. Just wrap it with the CRT. That's so because if suppose if you want if you write business logic here, suppose if you want to work this in offline, right? Then it, you will not be able to use it right, because you wrote the logic in retail server. Instead, if you wrote it in the CRT, as I showed in the previous slide, then you can just take the CRT DLL separately and put it in different scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So always it's like a best practice to write it in the CRT. Okay. Once you've done all of the customization, there's a packaging project. Okay. So here you just need to like tell the system, for example, here in the scale, if I did that project file, you need to tell like what all my extension project, what all my channel database, and then just consume this package. Okay. And then once you build this guy, so it's going to generate you a output package, okay, which contain all your customization. Say for example, if I go to this folder, so it, it generated the package. Sorry, this. So if I go here, you've seen that it generated the extension package. It's a, it's kind of like a zip file it generated with all the required file, the manifest. It also would have included all your DLL scripts and everything. It also created the config file under the extension folder. You can see all the different DLLs you included for your file. It all be included and packaged. Then you just need to take this zip package or the output zip package and then go to LCS, the lifecycle servers. Okay. 
here and then under the else's lifecycle service you will select common scale cloud scale unit extension you click the plus button and then say it will ask you to import that zip file so once you imported it then you can just go inside your environment and then you can click maintain apply updates then it will show you a if i click like apply updates it will show you a drop down to select the extension packages so it will load the extension packages here then you can click select and apply so it will get applied to your environment here you can also automate all this through like uploading the package through through azure devops pipeline okay for now you have to since we don't want like the devops pipeline to manually even deploy to production environment or so so we don't have like the automated task to deploy directly to the environment but you can use use the azure devops pipeline and you can automate till like uploading to lcs yep. okay that's a quick demo on the crt extension okay I will go back to my slide deck. So the next, so we now talk on the three blocks previously should we talked about HQ and we talked about the point of um, headless commerce engine, which has CRT and retail server, how to create the extension, what are the patterns and how you package and deploy. Now, now the last topic and uh, is the point of sale extension. Okay, so the point of sale is basically the client. So we also have the point of sale application basically like we have like the same app the same source code run in four different ways like you can run it in four different ways one is the modern point of sale application which is like a windows uwp app okay the next is the cloud point of sale which is like based on your scenario you can use the windows application or you can use the browser based cloud pass or you can use ios and android app also the code basis i will later show that in the slide but the code base is kind of same across all these four app it's like this code is shared between all the four the one customization you do will work in all these four cases yeah okay so we'll talk a little bit about the overall pos extension architecture and what all the extension you can do and how you package and deploy and then we'll end with a quick demo on this one yeah okay so the next as i talk like we're gonna talk about the pos extension here okay so as i said the pos extension is like four types of app or the four ways we can use the point of sale on this the size like the modern point of sale which is like a windows universal app okay we just return in previous like html css and typescript okay and this and the same app can also like run in a browser in that case the browser files are like hosted in the azure web app okay we call it as the cloud point of sale so you just give the endpoint url in your browser and it will render it and you can use the same application in the browser also. Okay. Similarly, we have the iOS and Android. These are like, it's not like a fully native app, but we create a kind of a native shell in iOS and Android. Inside that, we just render the cloud point of sale. We use the kind of the web view, and then we render this cloud point of sale. Basically, like it's just like the iOS Android is like a shell, which internally run like the browser app. Yeah. So you will not see like the browser header or something. We kind of the header is like it then. So internally it's kind of like within that app, it's running the, the same cloud point of sale. Okay. So the same app deployed here will work across this all three different applications, either the web-based one or the iOS or Android. But the code base is shared across all the four. So one customization you do, you can like deploy it to the same. Either if you deploy it in cloud, it will work across all these three or you can deploy it only to modern point of sale. Yeah, but the same code can be like shared across all this different here. Okay, so you don't have to like repeat the customization based on different components or you are using. Okay. And from the extension pattern wise, what you can do is like you can customize the UI layer. Say for example, you can modify the existing UI to add custom columns, custom buttons, or like depends on the view some use you can do like custom controls also. Similarly, you can also do hardware station extension so you can make the client extend it to interact with any new hardware devices like say like payment device, which we support out of the box. But if you want to integrate with a custom payment device or any other additional hardware device, you can extend the client. Also, you can include the commerce runtime for the offline and the client here. This all these three applications since it's hosted in cloud, the well it doesn't support offline. Okay, only this the windows application supports offline yeah. and for offline let's locally talk to the own sql server or the sql express database here yeah. okay also you can customize the client for the 
workflows or the activities we call it the same like the workflow like after adding item to cart if you want to ask for some recent code or if you want to ask somebody to check for permission so you can all do do those kind of validation or like change those business logic also in the client okay the client also support very similar extension pattern same like the crt you can do pre trigger before any operation or post trigger or you can override the handler in addition the client also supports the ui customization and everything in the pos also it's kind of request response so you can modify it same like crt client has its own request response there will be some one on one match but not all of them is like one on one match between crt and retail server but you can see the list of apis and everything available in the client and then you can customize do a pre post or like override the handler okay and also you can create your own custom view UX and everything on the client. If you are building new functionality, then you can add your own views and other things, and also modify our views here. Okay. And then once you are done with the customization, you will package your extension separately. You can have like n number of extension package. It can include if you have like offline, you can include the CRT. If you have the hardware station HW is like for the hardware station, then you can include those hardware station extension and your client extension. And then you will create output package which you can install and deploy it separately. Yep. Okay. So with that, I will quickly show a POS extension. Okay. Currently, the POS uh, SDK is not available in the GitHub, but we are planning to publish that very soon. Okay. So you will open the modern point of sale. If you see the, as I said, like the code is shared between the cloud and modern point of sale application. So assuming like if you are customizing modern point of sale, you will open that solution file. And then as I said, like you can do pre-trigger. Say for example, before adding the item, you want to do a, some validation or check, you will extend the pre-product sale trigger like this, or like the post-product after adding items, you want to do something, you can extend the post-product sale triggers. Okay. So for example, after item is added, I'm integrating with the new custom hardware device. So you can extend this trigger. So assume like you want to, once item is added, you want to show some display in a line, di line display or some any other kitchen display you want to send like display information right then you can extend the post trigger and then do it or you can do additional validation similarly suppose if i want to override the handler say for example some product request serial number right in that case i don't want to ask the cashier i want to call my web service and then get the serial number right then you can override the serial number handler okay and then say for example for this item id instead of asking the user automatically send the populate the value right so you can pass the value to this request and then you can also automate this and kind of like over instead of showing the dialogue i am kind of like automating the flow so you can also override the handler so for this like we have like a handler supported handlers which you can override okay the other one the last one is like and also you can create new views so for example i will show like you can create custom views and buttons and also you can do existing view extensions also so here for example under the view extension, I have extended the product search screen to add custom columns and buttons. So here you can see like I added custom columns. I added like custom button. Once I click this custom button, I want to navigate. This is my like a custom view, which you show like hey, how do you want to create like a header split view or how do you want to like create a alphanumeric number? This is like more like a sample code, but the idea is to showcase like you can create your custom view and add your other additional functionality. Or on a click of a button, I want to show like some custom dialogue or do some validation. You can do all those kind of different extension. The other one is also you can also do like custom controls like this. Not all views support. It depends on the view. So you can add like custom controls and then say, for example, you want to select item and then print like custom labels. So you can add some custom buttons to print labels. So you can do like a lot of different kind of extension on the client side. Yeah. Okay. And then once you're done with the customization, so you will just like build this project and then it will create like output package file under the retail SDK. When you run the final build command like the MS build command, it under the packages, it will finally generate the deployable package with all the, maybe I didn't like run the package, but you will see like all the packages created here and then you can use that and deploy to your environment here. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we are almost coming to end of the client side extension. So from the overall flow as a developer you get the extension you package you do all your customization you package it and then you deploy upload lcs and then you finally deploy to your environment you can also as i said like integrate with the devops pipeline okay. so 
So the last quick summary of overall what we did thing. So as a customization, you can see that all the yellow box are like kind of customizable. You can customize the headless commerce engine for business logic. Okay. Also, you can customize the same headless commerce engine for offline scenario. You can also customize the client. Okay. And then host it either in the cloud or like an on-prem depends on your scenario. Once you're done with all this customization, you'll package it and then you can deploy it to different environment, either like the cloud hosted environment or your self-hosted or like the modern point of sale for offline. And also you can, if you have like any back office customization, you can deploy that here yeah, to X++. Yeah, I think Sam will cover in detail about the e-commerce. Yeah. yeah, with that, I will hand it over to Sam. Yeah. Great, thanks, Great. Great. thanks, Vigatan. All right, so for e-commerce extensibility, I'm going to cover a little bit of a deeper dive on the architecture. I uh, will cover the tech stack, packaging and deployment, and provide a little bit of a demo. All right, so we've seen this diagram earlier before. This is the box I'll be covering, and um, you'll see here that this is the web storefront section right here. So um, first I want to talk about our tech stack. Uh, it's a little bit different than what Maguntin was showing. It is um, using Node.js, React, um, our modules. I'll, I'll define what a module is in a few minutes, but we use React modules inside of our e-commerce uh, rendering site. And um, for those modules, we use TypeScript. And for UX JavaScript, uh, UX library, we're using Bootstrap. Uh, our modules that we build uh, as part of our module library uses Bootstrap, but if you're building your own custom modules, you're free to use whatever uh, UX library that you want. Okay, so if I go back to this box right here, let me go back a second, this web storefront box here, this is what it looks like in an exploded view. So over here, uh, again, it's just the e-commerce customer hitting your website. Now within the web storefront, uh, this is where our rendering platform lives. So basically what happens is the page controller will figure out what page you're requesting. It'll go off to the commerce site builder services. And in essence, when you build pages within our site builder, it's being stored in a CMS system uh, as JSON documents. So the JSON document will get uh, pulled and stitched together at this layer and then passed into our node layer right here. So within the node layer, there's uh, three sections I, I've blocked off here. So the first is the runtime. So uh, you'll see here uh, the SDK is part of that. We have a bunch of platform modules, a uh, platform data actions, and the uh, TypeScript retail proxy. Uh, Maguntin mentioned that a little bit, but we, we provide uh, the retail proxy around all of um, the retail server APIs so that they're available. Um, but you can also, if you've written your own uh, retail server or CRT extensions, you can also add your own uh, retail server proxy. The middle column represents the module library. There are some configuration files that allow you to configure site settings, for example. But the three meaty things that a mo the module library uh, comes with is a set of modules. So there's over 80 modules a set of data actions and data actions. The job of a data action is to get data for your module. I'll actually, uh, the next few slides, I'll explain all uh, these three modules, data actions, and then finally themes. So in that last column on the right, that shows what you can extend. You can extend all, all of the ones I was just talking about. So modules, data actions, themes, as well as add additional site configurations. So notice um, the arrows down at the bottom are pointing to the commerce scale unit. So um, or external data sources. So the retail proxy, for example, talks directly to the scale unit. So when a data action needs to get information like product information, maybe the, the uh, price, the title, the description, et cetera, that will call down into the commerce scale unit to get that information. But you can also write data actions to call a, a third party uh, service if you need to get external data. Now, a question actually that came up is, is a great question is, you know, if I need to get data from an external service, uh, where do I build that? So there's generally two answers to that. If you're building a um, omni-channel uh, feature where you need the service for not only e-commerce, but maybe your retail server for your point of sale or your call center, then the natural place for that is going to be within a CRT extension. So the headless commerce extension, that way all your channels can leverage 
that data as well as the business logic. If it's something purely for e-commerce, then generally you'd put it in a, the data action. Or if it's something to do with how your uh, UX will lay out, then you put that in your uh, data action. So now let me define those three pieces a little, a little more deeply. So modules represent the core building blocks that make up an online page. In a few moments, I'm gonna show you what, uh, what that page looks like in Site Builder in case you haven't seen it. Um, and so some examples here are you might have a feature or a hero module that is displaying information on your page. So a home page, for example, might have some marketing images, some text, some click to call to action buttons. Um, your header module is another module. Now, the header module that we ship as part of our module library is a special module. We also call it a container module because it contains other sub uh, child modules such as the search module, a sign in module, the nav module, etc. And we do have some UI list uh, modules I wanted to call out. So a script injector module is one example of it where within Site Builder you can add some JavaScript and it will get injected onto the page, but not necessarily add any uh, UX to the site itself. So next is data actions. And like I mentioned, that's used to get data actions, uh, get data. Um, or apply business logic to a module, as well as share data across modules. So if you're building multiple modules that need a shared set of data, you can use data actions for that. So we do provide a, a core set of data actions, as you saw in the diagram, there was some platform and module library uh, that has data actions for you to use, and then custom data actions that you can create. So you can create those data actions to call uh, your own third party service or uh, use the uh, proxy APIs that we provide to call into um, any of our services like the retail server or our AI library um, or AI services or uh, other services such as ratings and reviews, etc. You can call those or any of your own uh, APIs that you may have created in the CRT um, that you've exposed. OK, so last area I haven't covered yet is our themes. So um, themes contain the SAS or CSS, if you're more familiar with CSS, uh, style definitions and control the general look and feel of a site. So you can only uh, configure a site to have one theme. And I'll show that in a moment. And themes also support something uh, that are called style presets. So style presets are a bunch of variables that are exposed to the site builder that will allow your site author to easily configure and change those so they don't have to drop to code. They can do codeless changes. But you can also create more than one style preset. So some examples of a set of uh, uh, presets might be a set used for a dark theme, a light theme, a classic theme, and a vintage theme. And then the site can be changed to whichever one uh, is needed. Oh. Themes also provide the ability to override a module view and module uh, configuration properties. What this means is that not only can a theme change the CSS of one of the modules, and that could be one of the uh, built-in module library modules or a custom modules, but it can also uh, override the view, and that allows you to change the actual HTML that's being rendered for that module, um, so that we if you need to make some minor changes to one of the modules we ship, you can do that within a theme. If you need to do broader mod module changes, you can also clone one of our modules, um, and that basically makes a copy of it. And so uh, I won't go into details on that, but I have other talks, um, tech talks that we've gone into much more detail on that. So let me quickly switch and show you uh, the visual of what a module looks like and a theme. So uh, over here, I have the site builder loaded. This is the home page for a site builder. So let's talk about themes first. So at the top right here, I'm on my site Fabricam. But if I go into manage sites, um, there is a button to create a new site. This is where you initially pick your theme. So you can see Fabricam and Starter are the two themes that we ship. And AdventureWorks is a custom theme that I've built right here. So I won't, I won't create a new site now, but that's how you initially set it up. Back in Fabricam here, once you have your site uh, created, there's a design tab here, and this shows your different available presets. In this case, the Fabricam has two that it comes with. There's always a default preset, and then there's another one that was just called default.fabricam. So these are two different presets 
that have shipped and you can make any one active that you want. You can also change. So if I select this view button, I can now see all the variables that I have access to. And so for example, if you're familiar with Fabricam, I'll just click over here for a second. You'll notice that the green accent color is used throughout the site. You can change that right here. Um, not These are the global settings, but there's also a module level setting. And you can customize what shows up in here for your site authors to use. You can add or remove additional properties. And you'll want to add some as you add your own custom modules as well. Um, and once you're done here, if you, uh, you can select any of these to be the active theme. And when you make changes to the default, it'll create a copy for you and you can now use that one uh, as your view. And if you ever want, you can remove those and you can go back to the default if you ever need to. That's about all I'm going to cover on themes. I've got a great tech talk on um, really that goes into depth on building your own theme. Uh, I'm now going to move over to showing you what a module looks like. So I'm going to hop over to our home page here. And what I see here is on the left is a tree view of my page. I have a rendering of the page in the middle. And then basically the right panel are my properties for the selected um, item um, in my view or in my tree over here. So for example, notice, in fact, I'll, I'll go over here for just a second. Notice this page here is made up of several modules. Uh, we have a header module up here. And again, we have some sub modules. We have a search module, a sign in module. Up here, we have a banner module. This is called a carousel module. And within the carousel module, as you flip through the carousel, there are different um, items in here. So I'll show you what that looks like from the tree view. So notice here's a carousel module. And when I select it over on the right, I'll see a bunch of properties that I can modify. I need to click edit if I want to make any changes. That's why it's all grayed out right now. Or I can select one of the sub modules underneath that. So I'll select the first content block. Now the content block has different layouts. This is the hero layout. A little lower, this, these are a tile layout of the same module. And so you can see you can make modules look and feel quite different based on a layout. Um, and then there are properties like a heading, a rich text, um, there are images, there's all kinds of configuration properties. So as you um, build your own modules, you have the full flexibility of adding any of these configurations. You can also extend any of the modules to add or remove some of these if you need additional uh, fields in here. Um, let me see here. OK, that is about all I want to show you on modules. Um, I've shown you modules, themes within Site Builder. Data actions don't show up here. They're kind of hidden from the Site Builder. They are they are just used when you're navigating your site. Each module is, is using a data action to get its data. So for example, when I select a category on this page here, there is a data action that is driving getting the results uh, for this. Uh, for this category and the data is being displayed in the module, the appropriate module here. I'm going to go back to the deck now. And so I want to talk briefly about setting up a development environment. So McGunthan mentioned there's a VM available that is used a lot of times for uh, development of your, your uh, headless commerce or uh, your point of sale extensions. Um, with e-commerce, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit lighter. Um, you can use any um, dev environment, you can use a laptop, a machine. You could even install these tools on the VM if you want. Um, but what you need is Node.js. So that's your JavaScript runtime engine. So you can um, debug and build your modules and see them locally in that environment. Uh, Yarn is a tool that runs on top of NPM. So if you've ever used Node.js before, you probably have seen NPM, which stands for Node Package Manager. And Yarn is just an extra uh, tool that runs on top of NPM. It just simplifies a lot of things. So we use that tool. And Visual Studio Code is our source code editor. So once you install those, those generally, if I'm setting up a new machine, take probably about five minutes to get those installed. And then finally, the last thing you need to do is get our online SDK. So to do that, uh, you can see here the git clone command, or you can go right to the repo. And I have a link at the end of this to our documentation that will help get you started as well. But you can do this even if you don't have a, um, a, a commerce environment set up. You can start building modules locally. 
And finally, once you clone the repo, that doesn't get you the full SDK. When you run the yarn command, it will use NPM to pull down all the available packages. So in total, this takes roughly a little bit under 10 minutes to set up a complete end-to-end -end dev environment. So I wanna show you what that looks like. So I do have Visual Studio running right here. I've pulled down the SDK and I've added a couple of modules here. Now, the first thing I wanna call out is as you're building any code, it all gets stored under the source directory. So there's a modules directory, a themes directory. And if I was to add any custom data actions, uh, you'd see a data actions directory here as well. I just don't have any right now. When you first download the SDK, you'll see one module in here. It's just a simple hello world module. And you can see if I click on this TSX file that it is just a React component. So our modules are basically a one-to-one -one mapping of React components or React modules. So you can see here how this class uh, extends the React pure component. So I've built a custom module that I have here and you can see this TSX file as well. Um, you can see how in the name of my modules, product feature, and then I have this, uh, it's, it's extending the React pure component. And then finally, once I have the business logic needed for my module, it's then calling this render view down here, which exists in a view file. This view file allows you to, this, this view file is extensible. So um, in my theme, um, under my themes directory, notice I have my adventure works theme and there's a, you can, ex, you can extend these themes um, to be able to add your view extensions in here. Okay, so what I want to show you now is this running. I have my uh, node server running down here. I have a terminal uh, window open. I've already run, run my node server. So let me split my screen here and bring up a web browser. And what I'm going to do is load up um, my local host. Awesome. And then there's a helper uh, URL underscore SDK slash all modules that will give me a list of all the modules I currently have installed. So by the way, that port 4000, there's an environment file right here. And in this file, you'll see the port configured. So that's that's my node server running on this port. So you can change that to whatever you want. You can also in this file point to any commerce uh, server that you have retail server right here and that will allow me as I'm building my modules to pull real data. Now a lot of times I may not have a server to work against. Um, in that case we can just use mock data. So let me show you what one of these modules look like. Now um, I've only, if you recall, I only have two modules under here but why are so many modules showing up? These are all modules that are, are core modules or part, part of the module library. So notice in here one called promo banner for example. That's the module up here, but also notice it doesn't quite look like this when I clicked on it to run it. That's because no CSS is being applied. I have to tell it to use a theme. So I've created a theme called spring and, whoops. Actually, I'm sorry, I wanna use the Fabricam theme for this one. And there you go, you can see um, it looking more like this. Now it's using uh, mock data. That's why the, the um, text looks a little different than the one you see on the live site here. Now, if I hit the back button and go back to that list, I wanna show you my one custom module I have created here, product feature. Now this one, if I just show you the product feature module here, there's a definition file here. And what I've done is I've told it right here, data actions, to use one of our built-in data actions to get simple products. So that's going to give me product information and I have a mock file asking with a product ID in it. And um, then in my view, I've just, I'm outputting two classes uh, with data on the left and data on the right. Now notice it's not rendering two columns here. So if you're familiar with Bootstrap, this is a Bootstrap construct because a Bootstrap uses a 12 grid system. Again, what I need to do is I'm, I haven't told it to use a theme yet. And in the theme that tells, um, that tells you to use that that my theme tells me to use bootstrap. So what I need to do is just add theme and I've created a theme called spring and now I'm using bootstrap so I get those columns. And you can see this data is pulled in from my live server. But again, if I don't have a live server and again I've configured my server right in here, that's okay. I can just use mock data and you can see I have additional mock data when I'm testing that. I have a product title and an image and things like that. So pretty simple to do. The last thing I want to cover is deployment. 
So I'll go back to the slide here. And when you're ready and you are finished all your configuration changes, you can run a command yarn msdym365 pack. So we have a bunch of CLI commands. Pack is one of them. We also have one for creating a new module or a new theme or a, uh, a new data action. And um, this is just one of them. That will create a zip file that'll package everything up. And the same way McGunthan showed you how to upload an extension, you go into LCS. And in this case, in the asset library, you select e-commerce package, whoops, as shown here, and you can just add the file and upload it. That generally takes about 10 minutes to upload. And then you need to go to your environment that you want to apply it to and apply it. And that again takes about 10 minutes. And then those new modules and themes will show up in Site Builder once that's complete. So we are uh, out of time now, actually, and I reached the end, which is great. I do have this slide with additional resources. So we have, um, as you probably know, we have a, a Tech Talk series going on right now, and there is a URL to get to all the previous talks. And I have a few relevant talks that I brought up, like the uh, commerce overview and the architectural overview. And then the last one, how to extend the e-commerce. Um, is, a, is, a, is a good talk to get into more details on that. We also have some articles, but if you want to get a hold of us, one of the best places to do that is joining our Insiders Yammer group as well as our commerce forums. So hope to see you guys there and thank you for spending this time with us. And back to you, Evan. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. We would like to get your feedback on today's session. I have posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. That survey scores on a scale from one to five with five being the highest score possible and we thank you for your participation in that. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.